Good afternoon and a big welcome to the Institute on Religion, Law and Lawyers Work webinar series. The Institute on Religion, Law and Lawyers Work was established in 2001 and is the culmination of Fordham's efforts to serve the increasing numbers of attorneys, judges, scholars and students who desire to integrate faith values and perspective in the context of challenges of legal practice. The Institute aims to promote an open, positive and constructive dialogue on religion and law issues. A big thank you to Interfaith Youth Corps and our, uh, um, other co-sponsors for their outstanding support in helping us put together this event. Um, now to today's business. The COVID-19 pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, the current politically charged climate have shed light on the impact of systemic racism in American societal structure. Massive uprising recently reviewed the urgency for centering racial equity in America's civic life. During the civil rights era, faith-led demonstrations and interfaith leaders came together to advocate against racial segregation and oppression. Today, when access to technology, test books, and other essential materials needed for teaching and learning seems to be a constant challenge for most minority families and communities, the Institute of Religion, Law, and Lawyers Work at Fordham Law School, collaborating with Interfaith Youth Corps, has put together this webinar themed race issues and education in America to engage relevant stakeholders to find a lasting solution to this persistent challenge. My name is John Yabo Amensa, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. I, I am lucky and I'm joined by three accomplished um, panelists. Um, the first is an internationally recognized award-winning educator, entrepreneur, speaker, authority on cross-cultural understanding, and the founding the founder and CEO of Bridging Cultures Group, INC, Dr. Debbie Amontes. Doc, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And um, the second is uh, Professor Sarah Diem, a professor in the Department of Education, Leadership and Policy Analysis at the University of Missouri and the author of Anti-Racist Educational Leadership and Policy, Addressing Racism in Public Education. Professor, Professor, thank you very much for joining us as well. Thanks so much and thank everyone for joining us today. And last on my list is um, Mr. Terrence Sullivan. He's the Executive Director of the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. Um, I hope I did that justice to the bios, but if there's anything I didn't add, um, please kindly help me do so. So what we are gonna to do today is have a conversation on this um, thematic area that I've already spoken about. And I'd like to dive in straight to the first question to um, Dr. Debbie. So Dr. Debbie, is there a role for faith and faith diversity in education? And how can faith be used to address um, race issues and racism in the education system? Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for having us. Um, you know, this is a topic that is very close to my heart um, as a, a veteran of the New York City public school system for the last 25 years. Um, and then the author of Leading Wild Muslim, which actually looks at you know, race relations um, and ethnicity um, and religious bigotry and bias. Um, this is something that is really uh, crucial for us to have a conversation. And, you know, the body of research that I did for my doctoral program at Fordham University um, was specifically focusing on the leadership of American Muslim school leaders in public education. And what I looked at was whether or not the political discourse the global events and the media coverage of Islam and Muslims uh, were affecting the leadership and spirituality of these American Muslim school leaders working in public education. And sadly, what we saw was um, all 14 were affected in some shape, way or form. And it certainly had something to do for some more than others because of their racial background. So within the body of 14 people that were a part of my study, 
um, actually eight of them were um, African American. Um, and so looking at the impact that they had experienced, um, especially the women, where one of the things that they said um, in my research was that they felt they had to prove themselves three times more than others. And I asked them to explain what they meant by that. So what they meant by that was one, because they were women, two, because they were African-American and three, because they identified as Muslim, that they felt that they had to prove themselves three times as much as their counterparts um, and face a lot of adversity um, in terms of racism and bigotry. And so I think that this conversation is really critical, you know, from the schoolhouse to the White House for us to have and to make sure that not only our school leaders, but our children, our parents, our teachers, the whole entire school community um, feels, you know, embraced and welcomed um, for their, you know, identity, whether it's race, whether it's religion. Um, and so one of the things that is missing right now in public education is the fact that back in 2017, um, the National Social Studies Association actually, um, uh, what they did was they actually uh, revised the Common Core and the C3 framework. And what they basically said was it was critical for um, students in K to 12 to learn in, in the social studies curriculum about religious diversity. Now, what does that mean? It means that they simply have the opportunity to learn about the faith tradition of their peers in their very classrooms. Now, the important word here is about, right? It's not to learn the religion, but to learn about the various diverse religions in our community. And the reason that this body, the National Social Studies Association, wanted to do this was because they saw the rising um, you know, uh, statistics of bigotry um, and anti-Semitism and, and everything that we see that actually uh, erupts from the lack of education about the various faith traditions. And so they basically made these revisions back in 2017. Um, they have been working to try to get the entire school system across the United States to adopt this C3 framework um, and to make sure that religious diversity or what they call it religious literacy is incorporated in the social studies curriculum. And so one of the things that I've been doing is doing a lot of presentations on this very topic for us to start having these kinds of conversations. So for example, one of the ways that I tackled this was I partnered with the American Federation of Teachers um, to actually incorporate um, the first of its kind, a, re a resolution um, in opposition of anti-Muslim bigotry and discrimination. Um, in their in the entire you know union, which has like almost a million members that are both educators across the country and in different um, you know different sectors. But in addition to that, um, starting locally in our communities right now in New York City, um, what I have worked on is actually a resolution to incorporate religious literacy and diversity in the New York City public school system. So. We are presently at the moment of having um, the city council and the coming weeks to actually um, vote on this resolution. And hopefully then it will become a bill that the mayor would have to actually um, institute in the New York City public school system. So, you know, this conversation is really critical for us to try to get this kind of information um, and these kinds of resolutions and bills across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Debbie. Now, um, my next question is to you, um, Professor uh, Sarah. Um, would you say that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, um, exacerbated the racial inequality in the education system? Um, yes, for sure. I mean, I think we all have seen how COVID has really crystallize the existent racial inequities in our education systems. Um, I mean, the education system before COVID was already not serving um, black and brown families and, and COVID has really laid bare the already existent inequities in education. Um, you know, we also think about how COVID um, has disproportionately affected black and brown families and um, 
facing inequality in health care and, and a lot of families living in multi generational housing and and we're also seeing white families have been using their resources to make sure that their children have educational options so we're seeing this potting you know popping up everywhere across the country um, even white families taking their children out of public schools and enrolling them in schools where in-person um, learning is occurring so it's this opportunity hoarding that's happening a lot among um, white families and it's it's really furthering the racial divide. And if these families do leave their public school districts, these districts will then lose their funding. So it will just continue the inequities that are already occurring um, in school districts across the country. And you know, I also think it's really telling um, when we're seeing data in terms of higher percentages of white families that are wanting in-person schooling to resume while lower percentages of um, black and brown families are wanting, um, you know, wanting their children to go back to in-person schooling. And, and many school districts are really catering to white families and are moving back to in-person learning when, when it's not completely safe. I think, um, you know, what's happening with Chicago Public Schools recently with the union, and, and I think they finally settled on something, but, um, you know, we need to have people in our schools vaccinated for people to feel safe. So, so yeah, it's, it's definitely really illustrated the racial divide that was already existent prior to the pandemic. Thank you. Um, um, Terrence, um, now, um, Systematic racism is, is a huge issue, especially in the education um, sector. So um, what are ways we can adapt to dismantle it? Uh, that's a great question. And if I had the exact answer, um, I'd be doing a lot different things right now. Um, but one big thing, and I wanna circle back to the previous question as well, because I think that that is, um, partly indicative of the answer. Uh, looking at the conversation around reopening is in some ways an opportunity to create, start larger conversations about a multitude of issues that people face because um, there are things that people don't recognize as issues because they're not the issues that they're facing. I, I love the term opportunity hoarding. Uh, I'd never heard that before, but now I'm going to use it all day. Um, but the concept of opportunity hoarding, um, there are people who have certain advantages that they don't recognize as advantages because they've never been without them. And I think that our current situation has hopefully opened the door to having those conversations about unknowns that other people face. Because again, going back to the reopening conversation and where I am in Louisville, Kentucky, um, in our large urban district of 100,000 kids, um, we're not in person. And it's a largely non-white population. And again, we're not in person, but there's a large conversation around the state with a hundred and we have 163 districts, I think, and there are, most of them are going back in person and most of them are rural, small town, small county schools where um, some of those people have been able to opportunity hoard and go to other school districts or whatever that are offering in person. So then those other districts say, oh, well, I guess we need to open up too or we're gonna keep losing people. It's also been a thing with people wanting to play sports. They've been transferring to private schools so they could play sports. And hopefully, um, or just those types of things are very significantly impacting certain communities. And there's been a lack of real conversation about some of the people who are involved on the other end of the spectrum and not really understanding, well, these people have, they live in multi-generational housing with a lot of family or uh, a bigger piece for me is I coach at a private school. Um, I coach track, but a lot of the public schools can't go back in person because their families aren't 
as wealthy and they don't have the jobs where they can stay at home and they have the jobs in the service industry where they're seeing people all day, every day. And there's that fear of spread that is not being discussed that's completely dependent on the circumstances in which those students live and where their families are. And so hopefully, to go back to the question you asked me, sorry, um, is these types of things in this, these types of considerations need to be addressed at a more systemic level because now hopefully people's eyes are open to the fact that we're not all coming at this from the same place and we're not all, we're not all going to ever exist in the same place. And so, um, and this will tie into the first question you asked too, since I'm just going to opportunity hoard all the questions right now, but I, I've always thought that learning um, in faith and learning about other religions, um, one thing that's been consistent in studying religions and is understanding that there are, there's a lot of focus on understanding others and being good to others and doing right by others. And I think that in this space, hopefully people use that learned em empathy through faith and can use that to try to understand the circumstances where people are and make better decisions and make more informed choices on how we address things in education and how we structure our demands and asks of students by taking into consideration where they are and where we hope they can be. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question is to you, um, um, Sarah. So, um, one thing that um, um, affects um, applications or admissions into school is uh, um, geographic indications. For example, school zones and all that. Now, uh, there are, it, it is known that some locations have the choices of schools. Now, and in these locations, minorities are less um, represented. The numbers in there are, are minimal. So what are some of the approaches we could use to um, counter uh, these, uh, should I say, invisible barriers? Yeah, so I think if we're thinking about in terms of equity when um, we're thinking about the school application process, um, and if we really want racial equity, um, this process really has to be holistic and not just based on a few different indicators. Um, you know, we have to create policies that will produce diverse student populations, and we need to make sure that all schools are of high quality and, and um, families will want to send children to those schools regardless of where they're located. Um, you know, thinking about Kentucky and, and Jefferson County Public Schools, they've historically had this student assignment plan um, where, well, now the most current iteration, they have clusters where they draw from different geographic parts of that cluster. And they also use different factors. So they use, and Terrence, you can correct me if, I, if I'm not as up to date about it. Um, they use parental income level, um, education level, and also the, the demographic makeup of census tracts in those clusters. So they, they're you know, intentionally trying to create diverse schools. So if we're having these choice plans um, and we really want to get at racial diversity and racial equity, we call them controlled choice plans. So we're putting in specific measures to make sure that um, we're drawing from different parts of um, communities and neighborhoods because we're so residentially segregated that we have to, we have to institute um, these type of policies if, if we really want our schools to be um, diverse. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Debbie, um, one challenge that also um, minorities face, um, um, religious minorities, uh, race minorities face, is um, finding the, the, the appropriate or the, uh, finding the right education options for their children. And you have been an educator, you have been a, a, a trainee, and, and you have been in administration as well. So how would you advise the approach to be? Sure, um, you know, when I think about, you know, 
public education and the way that it was instituted, right, in, in American history, um, public education is actually a, a human and civil right that every child um, across this land has a right to have a free and equal, um, you know, uh, education. Um, and so one of the things that we've been seeing, and this is a phenomena that I actually um, also raised um, in my research uh, during my dissertation was how, you know, religious minorities um, in, you know, early history of American history, because they didn't find them, themselves or their children to be welcomed and embraced because of their religious identity, what many started to do was create their own schools. So you had you know, the Catholic schools um, establish, you know, the archdiocese with Catholic schools. Um, then you had the Jewish community that started developing yeshivas. Um, and so what we had was isolation pockets of different religious groups. Um, and not to, to uh, you know, forget um, or diminish, you know, the whole, you know, phenomena of, uh, of public education um, and the erasure of, um, of African Americans and the black community and the fact that there were segregated schools which were not you know, uh, equal um, in the way that they were uh, funded and the way that they were um, supported. Um, so that's also you know, an, another aspect um, of our history that we have seen over the course of you know, this vast history where you know, though right now, you know, we have worked on, you know, desegregating our school systems. Um, we still have, you know, the Catholic school system. We have the Islamic school system. We have the yeshiva school system. And it's because many families have chosen this. Um, but one of the things that I think for us, you know, here at 2021 that we have to ask ourselves is how do we make public education um, you know, welcoming and inclusive of all of these, you know, diverse religious groups, ethnic and racial groups. And, you know, going back to the question that was asked of Terrence, you know, what we need to do is to make sure that our schools are fully equipped with cultural competency training that will start with the teacher, you know, with the staff, with the administration that's leading the efforts in these schools and making sure that we're doing implicit bias, making sure that we are um, incorporating um, religious literacy to help them better understand the very students that are sitting in their classrooms and the families that they are serving. And I think once we take this comprehensive holistic approach um, and being able to address these, our schools will definitely be the microcosm of the world um, to welcome all and make sure that every child walking through that door doesn't have to leave all of these identities um, that they hold near and dear in their hearts at the door because you know their school is expecting them to just be one thing um, or to just speak English. So I think that um, you know there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and it really. You know, it stems from you know the federal level. This has to be incorporated by the federal government um, at the U.S. Education Department. That we need to make religious diversity uh, and literacy a priority, and we need to make um, cultural competency to address all of the multiple identities that our students have. Um, and make sure that there is funding that is funneled to start doing this important work, especially right now um, in the aftermath of what we have seen, um, you know, just this past year with the, the brutal murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, and I can continue listing the names, but, you know, we have to start addressing this head on and the only way we can is through education. Fantastic. Um, professor, um, so do you think we are at the point where uh, after this COVID pandemic, we have learned lessons that um, uh, we, moving forward, we would find a better approach to um, setting up our um, education systems? Uh, for example, currently, a lot of people are, are, are not having easy and uh, access to textbooks, technology, et cetera. Have we learned our lessons now? Do you, do you foresee their future changing? 
Um, I always want to be hopeful, um, <laughs> but I have to be honest that I'm very worried about what's going to happen as a result of um, COVID, particularly when it comes to public education. I think that we're already seeing now in a lot of our um, state legislatures, um, COVID really being used as a way to further attack public education um, and to go more towards um, school choice, which, which is not school choice for everyone. So um, I'm really concerned what's happening at the state level. And, and I think going back to what Debbie was saying, it's so important at the federal level that we need um, to do for a lot of these issues to be handled because it, it sets the tone for, for states too um, when it comes from the federal level. Um, so in that sense, I'm more optimistic because I'm, I'm more optimistic with um, who hopefully will be our next Secretary of Education, someone who deeply believes in public education, who himself um, was a teacher, was a principal, an assistant superintendent, and um, some of the appointees that we're starting to see in the Department of Education, um, you know, have a, it's a diverse group of people that have um, so much experience, um, you know, a lot of them in schools themselves, whether it's PK-12 or higher education, and they're deeply committed to working with um, communities of color and low-income communities and, um, and have a commitment to civil rights. So I think I'm, I'm optimistic um, on that level at the federal level that um, public education will once again be valued. Um, but I'm really worried at the state level with um, a lot of bills that we're already starting to see when it comes to um, to not really valuing public education the way I think it should be valued. Um, Dr. Debbie, what do you think? You're, you're on mute. Yes, I always forget that button. Um, I think that what Sarah has covered, um, you know, really um, speaks to it all. Um, I think that one of the things that we have to do, um, though there are, you know, uh, great candidates that are, um, you know, coming forward um, on a federal level, is that we can, we need on a grassroots level to continue pushing the agenda. Um, because one of the things that I also am always concerned about, you know, from a federal perspective is that, you know, we tend to issue policies, um, you know, to all 51 states, um, but sometimes those policies may look different from, you know, in one state to another. And I think that we need to give, you know, states the flexibility to be able to start doing that work from a place of where people are at um, and, and really um, supporting them. So, you know, a, an example of that is the No Child Left Behind um, Act, which, you know, quite frankly, um, for many of us in the field of education felt that almost all of the children were left behind because it was a policy that was brought from the top down. Um, it didn't reflect um, the very needs that needed to be specifically handled on a grassroots level. So I'm hoping that our job as advocates will be to work alongside um, all of these people on a federal level and help them understand what the exact needs are for our communities and how we can drive that agenda to achieve that common goal that we want to have on a, a, a you know a, a national level um, as well as a local level. Fantastic. Now uh, this this next question goes to everybody. Now um, we have people who are not in the education sector, they are not researchers, they are not policy makers. So how do they help to transform the system? I'll, I'll start from Terrence. Sure, so I wanted to start my response by, um, I guess, countering from where you were coming. Um, I think everyone here who's paying attention or who wants to be part of any type of movement. Um, I think they're all just by interest alone, um, part of the solution and part of the way to shape policy and the way to teach um, because everyone here is an educator in some sense that we teach others by the way we conduct ourselves. And we may not be trained 
professors or classroom teachers, but we all educate other people on what we think is right or should happen based on our own conduct. And people who are invested, um, regular citizens and non-researchers and all of that, um, they're still policymakers because collectively you can drive policy by action and gathering a group together for a collective goal and saying, hey, this is what we want, this is what needs to happen and driving policy. Or if you're not, if you don't have the resources to conduct research, you can, same, same premise, you can find ways to um, identify an issue and collectively gather around an issue and urge someone who does have that expertise to do research into that topic. And so what I think for people here who are listening or watching is to recognize your own strength and to be able to identify where you can contribute and how you can drive policy, you can drive research. That doesn't mean you have to do it yourself. It's just if you've identified an issue or an area that needs research or needs change, find ways within your own networks or in your circles or whatever to drive action in that in the way that you want it. Even if you don't have your the own or your own personal ability to do it, you do have a personal ability to influence it happening. Dr. Demi? You know, I um, I appreciate you, Terrence, and everything that you have um, you have recommended uh, really um, is is key. And I guess the message that I also would add to that is that if you are a parent, you have an important stake. If you are an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, um, you have an important stake in education. Um, and if you don't need any of the above, you know, uh, across the country um, and 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 you know various vicinities. Um, you know, people pay um, taxes that actually fund our education. So, you know, you want to make sure that the taxes that you are paying to fund education um, are being utilized in the best way to produce the next generation of, of leaders in our country. So I think that we all have a stake in education, no matter, you know, where we come from, what walk of life, what profession, we all have a stake um, and it's really important. And if you don't know how to plug into it, if you're a parent, your first place should be your parent-teacher association. Get involved in your parent-teacher association. Um, if you are somebody who is not a parent and interested, there are so many organizations that are doing public education advocacy, plug into that. Um, your local political clubs, um, should care about education. So there is always an opportunity, you know, and right now we live in, a, in an age where, you know, the internet has leveled the playing field. You can find a community that is working on education online and get involved in that way. So um, thank you. Prof. Yeah, I mean, I love everything that's been said. And, and I was going to say what um, Debbie just mentioned that supporting groups that are already doing this work and, and particularly um, groups that are um, communities of color, they've been doing this work for a very long time. Um, you know, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel um, because there, there are so many people really committed to this. And I don't want students to be left out of this conversation as well. Um, student voice, youth participation, it's so important. I mean, I even think at higher education level, the history of um, real change that's occurred in higher education has come because of students. Um, you know, at my own institution in 2015, we had, um, you know, movements happening around racial inequity and, and that that happened at a lot of higher education institutions across the country. So um, I don't want us to ever lose track of that student voice and the importance of, of youth in this process as well. Fantastic. Um, just a quick reminder, the Q&A box is functional. So if you have any question, you can put it in the Q&A box and I'll read it out. Now, um, Dr. Debbie, I, I, my, my next question is to you. 
and it's, uh, it's particularly on the interfaith collaboration. How do you, do you think uh, the best approach to working together to solve this issue is? How should they collaborate to solve this? Sure, I'm happy to give you a, 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 an, an excellent example of how interfaith communities have come together um, you know, on a common cause in public education. So um, in 2015, um, the New York City Department of Education incorporated the two Muslim holidays into the New York City public school system. Now, this did not happen just because the mayor who came in said, I want to have Muslim holidays. It was a concerted effort that lasted for about 15 years where advocates um, both in the Muslim community came together um, and other partners. But what made it uh, the most you know, a, a compelling um, case to actually incorporate these Muslim holidays was actually the uh, partnership of the interfaith community. So churches and synagogues and, you know, various um, faith coalitions realized that this was really a huge disservice to the 1 million Muslims living in New York City. And so what they did was they came together and they said, we're going to support you. If we have the Jewish holidays on the calendar, if we have the Christmas holidays, why can't we have the Muslim holidays on there? And so this coalition that was called um, the Coalition for Muslim Holidays was very robust with interfaith partners um, in addition to unions that basically realized that this was a huge uh, infringement on the rights of their own members who were families um, that couldn't, you know, stay home and watch their kids um, when, uh, you know, uh, the school, when actually, when they wanted to have their holiday, that they wanted their children to be home. So um, I think that, you know, there are moments, you know, um, and opportunities for communities to come together and collaborate. And, you know, like right now, this initiative that I mentioned earlier, the Religious Literacy Diversity in New York City Public School System, it is a coalition of interfaith groups that have come together and that are pushing um, this resolution. And hopefully it will become a bill that the New York City Department of Education will have to incorporate into the education system. Fantastic. Uh, I will go ahead to take my um, first question now. And it's coming through from Naseem. And he says, what other way can we reimagine education through law and policy? So um, this is open to all of you. Who wants to go first? Professor Sarah, you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I think Debbie just gave a really great example. Um, you know, reimagining education through law and policy. Um, again, if if we're trying to get at racial equity, um, I've seen some states that have actually passed um, legislation around teaching. Um, you know, having an anti-racist curriculum in their schools. So I think that's a way that we can get at it um, as well. We, uh, you know, our school curriculum, it needs to be more inclusive and honest about racism, white supremacy, and we really need to stop um, telling and teaching sanitized versions of history, um, particularly U.S. history. Um, so, I mean, I think that that can ha happen definitely like at the local school district level, but really at the state level, when we're thinking about curriculum and how, um, how different it is across states. I know I used in my class this year, I think it was an article, it either came out, um, last year or the year before that compared textbooks in um, Texas, where, I, where I'm from, um, in California, and just the teaching of history is just, it's just, yeah, it's, it's mind-blowing, like the differences of, of what students are being taught. So what can we do at state levels to make sure that, that we're really um, 
we're learning about the real history and we're, we're seeing a pushback right now with that too, with the 1619 project, um, that there are states across the country that are trying to outlaw it. Um, you know, particularly Iowa, with, where Nicole Hannah-Jones is from, who is behind the 1619 project. And um, so we really, again, like Debbie was saying earlier, um, what are we doing in our community at the grassroots level to, to push back at these things um, and try to um, create policy that that is really, um, you know, telling us the true story of history in, in our education systems. I, um, I would add to that. I'm sorry, Terrence, do you want to go ahead? I'll go after you. Okay. I would add to that, um, you know, to look historically at what our nation has done to ethnic studies, um, what it's done to bilingual education. I mean, we, these are all actually um, things that, you know, educators and academics and universities have introduced um, into the public education system, but we have seen time and time again where um, law, you know, lawmakers um, have basically taken these issues, you know, these education initiatives and made them into policy issues that we've seen public, you know, bilingual education actually being demolished, that we've seen ethnic studies being demolished um, and removed from um, various uh, school systems. So I think that we right now, um, have a great opportunity to, to nurture and to reintroduce ethnic studies and bilingual education um, across the country because you know these are what are, these are two things that are going to make us as a nation successful when we have a better understanding of the diversity that exists within our country um, that we are able to nurture you know uh, multiple languages through bilingual education this makes us more competitive globally. Um, and sadly, many have seen these as impediments to you know, who we are as Americans. Um, and so we need to push back and, and make sure that people understand that you can be American and you know, Mexican, you can be American and Yemeni American, um, and you can speak all of these different languages and you can be your whole person walking into public education um, and understanding um, and seeing you um, as a very important stakeholder that has so many worldviews that we can benefit from in a classroom setting. Um, so I think those are two things that we need to keep our eye on um, and that we need to, to push and make sure um, that they are reincorporated where they have actually been taken down. And then just to, to close this out um, and Sarah mentioned earlier how the district where I live um, has this intentional focus on trying to increase diversity with the clusters and all of that. Um, another thing that we've done here, and it's something I think is more approachable because it's things different school districts can do to really invest in local policy um, is one thing that we have is a racial equity and advisory council, which I was named on. Um, and it's just an 11 member panel with people from the community who, or who have some stake in the district who meet and discuss racial equity policies and things that the school district can do to address equity issues uh, according to race. And um, one thing that has come out of that, that the district does, and this is another smaller policy thing that places can do. And it's something that's really simple to um, create and to maintain is we have what's called the REAP, which is like the race equity um, advisory protocol. And for every policy or everything that the, something someone wants to do. Um, there's a checklist that you go through to say, okay, what is my intention? What's my desired result? Is there any group that this could impact disproportionately? If so, what? Um, what could we do to mitigate that? And just a checklist to go through for every decision that's being made. And it might sound burdensome to some people, but for the greater scheme of things, it's much more appropriate to try to consider 
what individuals might benefit differently from this before you have to then readdress it on the back end. And so an example was a policy that a teacher wanted to implement for a reward to have a different special lunch with the teacher um, once a week based on people who met X, Y, and Z criteria. Well, they laid out the criteria to be able to get that reward. And it was like, okay, you didn't intend for this to happen, but for the most part, the only kids who are going to get that benefit are going to be of one group or this group based on what you're asking is never going to be able to have that benefit. And so it was just a small in-class policy that a teacher wanted to implement. But by going through this checklist, they were able to identify that it was still going to disproportionately impact a group. And so then you work to tweak it to make it more equitable for all groups. And so being able to do things like that, that's a lot more immediate than long-term policy or getting the state legislature to do something or getting to the federal level and getting them to do something. All those things are equally important. But if you're looking for ways to just step in right now, maybe go to your local board of education and say, hey, I think we should have a group that focuses on racial equity in our school district. And then, or to the school level and say, hey, I think you should implement, if you're on the school board or you interact with the school board, I think that we should do something where we assess any policy action according to some checklist that identifies gaps. So little things like that, I think are important in making decisions and how you can address equity at a faster pace, I guess. Fantastic. Um, another question, it says from Nassim, it says, I feel like teachers in the school system really don't have the freedom to teach the truth. And so there's like a cultural war in the school community. What are some of the practices we can take in transforming the voices of teachers? and have them take the risk without feeling nervous in transforming education and the lives of their students. Um, Dr. Debbie, you'd want to start this? You know, this is, um, you know, uh, something that we, we see across the board as a phenomena um, where we have, you know, progressive educators that really want to do uh, amazing work um, and yet feel like their hands are tied um, because there are unfortunately school districts that um, are conservative in the way that they present curriculum, um, the way that they, um, you know, view the world. And so I think that one of the things that um, could be helpful for many of these educators is to really connect with other educators, you know, across the country um, who are really doing cutting edge work, um, you know, challenging anti-racism, uh, doing cultural, you know, diversity work, et cetera. Um, and so looking for online communities to, to have as a support, but also to look for community, uh, you know, groups that are in their local communities that are actually doing this. And the way to be able to push um, back on providing this kind of education is really when over the parents, um, you know, at the end of the day, parents have a say in the education of their children. And if they are on board and are supportive of our teachers, um, of our school leaders, then we can start to see that change happen where there is no fear factor, uh, you know, when it comes to teaching about, you know, the, the real history of, you know, uh, Christopher Columbus. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to partner with people and that you know, the, the best partner in making this change is actually the very families in our school who want their children to have an education um, that is meaningful and relevant and authentic to what really happened in history. Professor Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add. I thought that was a fantastic answer. And I mean, I'll just reemphasize the importance of um, the school leaders, too, because I think it really starts with them um, for teachers to feel empowered to be able to teach, um, you know, like Debbie was saying, um, cutting edge, um, important, timely topics. And, you know, my colleague, Dr. Anjale Welton, and I, um, you had mentioned earlier the book that that we just recently published on anti-racist educational leadership and policy and and in the book we really 
our goal of the book is to help educational leaders really realize the um, the racist policies that undergird the educational system and, and what they can do about them. And so we talk about different policies in, in each chapter of the book, but we conclude the book with an anti-racist um, protocol, anti-racist policy decision-making protocol. It's, it's a lot. Um, it's a mouthful. Um, but the protocol, it's really, it's the cycle of inquiry that we propose for school leaders um, that they can engage in that will help them unmask inequities that, that are deeply entrenched within the school district, um, our school norms, practices, and policies. And, and it's really similar. And, and we, we build off of people who came before us who have um, proposed equity audits um, of schools and other scholars who have, who have proposed community equity audits. Um, so really um, doing a deep dive into understanding the policies who we can bring to the table, who must be at the table um, when we're trying to craft new policies that are really pushing back at, at these inequities. It's fantastic. Ter Terrence, do you have anything to add? Um, nothing uh, that they didn't already cover, but I think it's really good to, again, highlight um, finding ways to allow teachers and educators to feel empowered to do what they feel needs to be done. And that comes with creating a culture and an environment that is conducive to empowerment and being able to identify what types of conversations need to be had and with whom to create that environment to then empower them to do what's right. Okay, um, there's another question from Zandra. It says, as a guidance counselor in NYC, we saw a huge uptick in mental health concerns among our students, especially our black, uh, black and brown students over the disparities the pandemic has shown in education equality. Our students felt helpless. What suggestions do you have to empower our students, especially our black and brown students, to stand up to their rights, at least in the education sphere? So, um, Dr. Debbie? Oh, that, that's, a, uh, that's a really, um, you know, important question to be, um, to be brought up and I appreciate that. Um, you know, the pandemic for us in New York City and, you know, um, seeing that firsthand uh, the impact that it's made on our lives, right? You know, whether you are socioeconomically, you know, uh, in the middle class, you know, or upper class um, and, and, you know, or in, 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 you know, the poverty line, we have seen how it is played out. Um, in, in so many drastic ways. And one of the things that we have seen in New York City is the lack of um, internet access to actually be able to even connect, you know, with your teacher and your peers. Um, the lack of um, streamlining of how to get tablets, you know, to children in, in various communities because of the language barriers, because of, again, the internet barriers um, has really played out and made it very difficult um, and so this type of isolation has impacted, um, you know, youth and their families in ways that we cannot imagine, you know, uh, mental health wise. And I think that right now, many of the advocates have, have pushed, um, you know, for the city to actually make sure that internet access was um, accessible um, and making sure that the tablets have become accessible for students. Um, but you know, there's still pockets where this is not happening and what we need to do is push. So my advice um, to that teacher, uh, to the guidance counselor that, um, that posed this question um, is that you know, for the students that we have access to is pr to provide them the opportunity um, to have um, you know, a, you know, a, a circle of just talking about how they're feeling you know, what are they feeling, um, you know, and, and giving them ways to actually be able to, to vent um, um, and share what they're experiencing, what they've experienced, um, and helping them learn coping skills to overcome these challenges, right? And, you know, again, the challenges are not just internet access or tablet access, 
but also the, you know, the socioeconomic, the psychological. Um, and I feel like right now the remote learning, what it, the role that it's played, um, you know, in our school settings across the country is it's all about academics and making sure that the children are getting academically prepared. Um, but there is no opportunity for check-in of simply, how are you doing? You know, how's your day? Um, how are you feeling? And I think that we need to incorporate some time during the day that we can have check-ins with our students and help them set goals for themselves to actually be um, successful, you know, one day at a time. So I think that would be the advice that I, I would hope would help be helpful. And, and I defer to also to my colleagues. Um, I, I'd like to remind everybody that this is uh, one part of a, a series of webinar events. So we'll be sending out information on um, future webinar in this particular series. Um, also, um, rounding up and then final thoughts, um, I'd like to start from Terrence. Um, as you are giving my, your final words, I, I'd love for you to also include um, resources that people can tend to um, educators, students, and then policymakers, they could um, turn to. This goes to all of you, but I would like to start from Terrence. Final words and final thoughts. Uh, my final words and final thoughts. Um, I'm really just thankful for this conversation. And I think that especially, I'm, I'm sitting here learning uh, from two very smart and studious people who have done a lot of work in this area. Um, my focus has mostly been in equity and law. And so hearing um, from different perspectives, I think is beneficial. And I think that is also good for others. Um, as far as things that resources people can use, um, I think you just heard <laughs> from Sarah about one that I, that I would recommend just from hearing some of the things that are in it, because that seems to tie in some of that outlook on finding ways to affect policy in a more granular way with a type of equity protocol or something like that. And so I think anyone interested in furthering that work instead of just listening to me mentioning it, um, there's something people can tangibly touch and read and feel and start doing that work. And so I think that's a great starting point. Sarah, any, any final words and thoughts? Thank you for that plug, Terrence. Um, <laughs> I'll add to the, um, as far as resources, um, in the U.S., there are um, equity assistance centers in the country. There are currently four of them. There used to be just a brief history of them. They really, um, they're funded by the U.S. Department of Education and, and um, they came to fruition after desegregation started happening and, and there were more of them, but now there are only four. And um, I'm involved with the one in my region of the country, 13 states, it's the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. And they have, um, I could put the link in the chat box. They have a ton of resources um, that I think all different stakeholders can use, whether they're policy briefs, whether they're um, manuals that educators can use for professional development, whether they're um, webinars, I mean, just so many resources that I think are available. And the center provides technical assistance to school districts um, for free. So as long as it's in, in the region and, and then, you know, the other three centers across the country as well. So I think that, that that's really a great place um, for resources. And, you know, I think just echoing what everyone has said today and, and also just being so fortunate to be in conversation with everyone today um, and the importance of talking with people um, that represent different um, organizations, communities. I think that's so important. Um, and, you know, just encouraging everyone to be aware and involved with what's happening at the state and local level in your communities when it comes to public education and contact your representatives in Congress um, to demand support for public education. We really, really need support for public education right now because um, it's so important for families, particularly um, families of color and low-income families. So um, those would be my last words. 
Okay, um, Dr. Debbie, I know of www.leadingwellmuslim.com, but I know you have access <laughs> sure. to a lot more uh, resources. So if absolutely, thank you, John, for the um, for the plug of my book. Um, it's certainly a, a great resource to help um, educators and school leaders learn about Muslim families and how they can actually be culturally competent to work with um, Muslim families. Um, I would say, in addition to everything that's been said. Um, follow on social media education leaders and influencers. Uh, there is so much information that actually you can learn um, and stay on top of. Um, and then also partner with community-based organizations that are doing um, equity work, anti-racism work. Um, and so my organization, um, Bridging Cultures Group, we do that and we specialize on Arab, Muslim and South Asian cultures among other cultures um, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion field. Um, you know, there's so much work that needs to be done um, and you can find partners in such groups that can help you really become experts in learning about your families. Thank you everyone. Uh, but so soon we have to come to the end of today's um, webinar series. Um, um, you can um, follow our speakers online and also check them out. Their bio is included in the link that we sent out. Um, there are going to be more um, webinar events in line with this series. And um, a very big thank you to all our speakers today. Um, this conversation can go on so long, but unfortunately, um, we, we have run out of time. And um, a very big thank you to uh, Interfaith Youth Corps for also supporting us to bring this event to you. Um, um, so the handle, the social media handles of our speakers are, for Professor Sarah is at SDM35, that's for Twitter. And um, for uh, Terrence is at TA Sullivan. And for Dr. Debbie is at Debbie Almonster, Amon, Amontesa. Um, yeah, and also another one for um, Professor Sarah is at Sarah DM35 um, on Twitter. Um, so do follow them. They have so much information that um, we can rely on. And um, so till we meet um, another time for our next webinar series, it's a, a goodbye from the Institute on religion, law, and lawyers' work here at Fordham Law School. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.